All right, hello again, everybody. Welcome back to Airbus 320 Tech Talk. What do all those buttons do? Welcome back. I am talking to you today from an overnight in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, thank you again for joining me uh, in my hotel room here. So uh, we are going to pick up our discussion on the overhead panel here where we left off last time. So the next order of business that we've got to cover today. Um, once again, the spirit of not leaving anything out uh, before I get to the main meat of the discussion today. Uh, moving down from this eight years panel that we talked about last time, this placard here, you might walk in the flight deck and wonder what the heck is this all about? B-U-S-S. -S. Is this just reminding me that I'm on an Airbus? <laughs> um, as funny as that might be, uh, no, that is not there. And I have no idea why they actually decided to placard this into the aircraft. I'm, I'm not sure um, the, the reasoning why the engineers thought that was necessary, but uh, this BUSS actually means backup speed scale, and it just lets us know that the aircraft has that capability on it for whatever reason. I, as far as I know, uh, pretty much every Airbus has this built into it. But basically, it's just a, a means. I wish I had a graphic on hand to show you, but uh, if there is some sort of problem with the way that the, air, the aircraft is displaying airspeed or maybe sensing readings or what have you, um, it can actually show you this alternate kind of like sliding um, green and red range kind of thing in place of the airspeed indicator on the left side of the primary flight display there. So it just kind of tells you, hey, as long as you know you keep the, um, the flight attitude in this regime here, you know you're at a safe airspeed, and that's you know, kind of what this backup speed scale is, is all about. So uh, if anybody out there knows the reason why they decided that they needed to placard in this into the, the flight deck, I would, I would love to know that myself. I, I haven't been able to find any sort of reference uh, as to the reasoning for that, but uh, that is what that is all about. So. Uh, moving down from there, we're going to be talking about these flight control switch panels right here. Now, there's one on the left side, and there's one on the right side. And we're going to kind of break down um, what all these things mean, the, the acronyms and whatnot. Uh, but one of the first things I wanted to point out to you is the fact that, um, you know, we have several different flight control computers on the Airbus. And um, on the left side here, notice how we have the number one uh, flight control computer switches for each respective system and over here they've decided to geographically totally place the the number two and in, in, in three sides um, on the opposite side of the flight deck and my assumption there is just that they are just trying to um, maybe build in an, an added way to just make extra sure that you're not shutting off you know two of these redundant systems accidentally by placing them very close to one another so it kind of makes a lot of sense in my mind why they they wanted to you know physically separate them out uh, in the placement of the overhead there. So that's just kind of an interesting thing. And uh, we're, we're going to talk about, you know, both these panels, you know, essentially in today's discussion. So I'm not going to bother and, and go back and make another video about the, uh, the right hand or number two and three side over here. But um, let's talk a little bit first about these flight control computers and, and you know, part, part about, you know, why they're there. Um, there's a couple really conceptual things that I wanted to talk about first as we start this discussion here to tell you about the Airbus. So, you know, as I said, these computers themselves are a very integral part of, of both of these inner workings of the airplane. And the first one we're going to talk about is fly-by-wire. So what does that mean? I'm sure you've heard the term. Um, it was actually kind of a little confusing to me when I first started learning airplanes because when I, you know, when I thought about, you know, wires and cables, I mean, these words sound very similar to me. But just to give a little history... You know, most aircraft um, uh, early on in, in aviation history, and even a lot of you know much more simpler airplanes these days, um, they've actually got cables and pulleys on the inside of the, uh, the structure of the airplane that physically connect the flight control column, for example, to the the surfaces. So you know, when you're you know making a movement to the yoke or the stick, for example, you're actually turning these little you know cranks and pulleys and cables, you know, uh, adding and loosening tension to actually get the uh, flight control surfaces to move. Now, with a fly-by-wire aircraft, what this the wire actually indicates is an electrical wire. And I wish they would have coined this term something differently, like maybe like fly-by-signal or something like that. I think it would be a lot easier for people to draw apart in their minds. But basically, it's this concept that you know you have a flight control surface. And in the case of the Airbus, we have this, this side stick. So the pilot makes an input, sends a signal through a wire to these flight control computers that kind of do all these complex you know, calculations and the computer kind of determines like what the actual output to the flight control surface should be. So out of the computer, uh, a signal gets sent out to the hydraulic actuators at whatever flight control service we're talking about, and it will translate to an actual movement of that, that flight control surface in and of itself. So that's, 
this, this term, first of all, fly-by-wire, what it means. And um, the second one that is uh, really important when we start talking about the Airbus is the fact that um, the Airbus has all these protections actually built in uh, to uh, basically try to prevent you in every possible way that it can from doing um, really bad aerodynamic things with the airplane, or in other words, getting yourself into a dangerous condition. And just from a very, very high-level conceptual standpoint, I wanted to try to explain to you a little bit about you know, how to think about this. So let's say that, you know, this, this sphere represents an envelope of all the different like types of maneuvers we could do with the airplane. And, you know, outside of the sphere is, you know, basically where bad things could happen. We could have a stall, we could have an overspeed condition, we could, you know, overstress the airplane, you know, maybe. So um, what Airbus has done is said, okay, you know, here's the, the sphere of the, the absolute, you know, capabilities of things you could do that, you know, with the airplane, but we're going to build in these protections into the system, and we're going to make your little sphere or sphere, excuse me, as a pilot down a little bit smaller, so that you know theoretically, like you can't operate, you know, much outside of this little protected region that we've we've determined is safe, and you know, most you know all times is more than enough capability you need to you know normally maneuver the aircraft around in a safe manner. But you know, they're kind of protecting you in this little bubble here from getting out, you know, outside to the the maximum. Um, you know, bad stuff regime or whatever you want to say uh, of the performance capabilities of the envelope of the airplane. So that's just kind of one way to, you know, think about these these protections so that, um, you know, once again, we're going to break this down in another video because this is a whole other complex topic of discussion to, to run by you. But um, the Airbus basically has, um, there's some kind of minor ones, but normal law, direct law, and... Um, uh, I'm sorry, normal law, alternate law, and direct law. And these are kind of like your, your step progressions um, of the, the protection uh, type of programming that we're, we're operating uh, underneath each time we're going out and flying. Most of the time we're in normal law. We're just doing normal things with the airplane. And as I said, I think there's a little bit of misconception um, maybe against, you know, I, I don't know, sometimes, you know, people think of this like, oh, well, you know, the Airbus is not going to, you know, uh, you should have full control over things as a pilot. It's not going to let you do the things you might absolutely need to do, you know, in, in certain situations. And I, I just don't really think that's all that true. I mean, 99.9% .9 of the times, you're never needing to exercise more of the capabilities like outside of this little, you know, sphere of protection that's built into the airplane um, for, for most normal scenarios and, you know, keeping the day safe and, and doing everything we need to do. So, um, I don't believe there's this huge disconnect between the inputs that we can make as, as pilots and, and uh, what we actually have, you know, need to have the airplane to do in, in given circumstances. So uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, and as I said, everything is just there to, you know, protect uh, uh, us, you know, from, as the humans from, from making these uh, dire mistakes that have been made over and over again. And um, most of the time it works out pretty good. Unfortunately, there is some accidents that, you know, another thing we could talk a whole lot about is, you know, accidents where, these uh, flight control computers kind of have came into play a little bit, but a lot of it really, you know, just translates back to a lack of understanding on part of the operator, you know, in other words, the human. So sadly enough, um, you know, bad things can still happen, unfortunately, but uh, for the most part, this is a very, very safe, safe aircraft and these systems work uh, beautifully, I think, you know, from as far as what I've seen so far. So um, just some high level conceptual things. Let me know if you have any questions about any more uh, intricate details with regard to that specifically, but um, moving on uh, to get a little bit more specific now. So on the Airbus, uh, we have several different types of flight control computers. So number one, uh, ELAC here. This stands for uh, Elevator Aileron Computer. And we have two of these on board. And just straight out of the book, uh, what are the ELACs responsible for? Well, normal ele elevator and stabilizer control, normal aileron control, normal pitch and roll, alternate pitch, direct pitch and roll, abnormal attitude, aileron droop, acquisition of autopilot orders, and uh, that is it for, for the ELACs. Um, the uh, SEC here, SEC, uh, stands for Spoiler Elevator Computer, and we have three of these on board the aircraft, and once again, right out of the book, uh, the, the SECs are responsible for normal roll uh, by controlling the spoilers, uh, speed brakes and ground spoilers, alternate pitch, direct pitch, direct roll, and abnormal attitude law. Um, moving on, we have next this FAC here, stands for Flight Augmentation Computer, and we've got two of these on board the aircraft, and these are responsible for normal roll control, 
uh, in other words, turn coordination and yaw dampening, rudder trim, rudder travel limiting, and alternate yaw. So um, kind of some, uh, I don't know, gee whiz terms there that, you know, as we continue our discussion, we start to talk about flight control laws later on down the line that will all kind of tie in. But uh, just for, for now, that's all you really need to know. Um, I pulled a schematic out of the QRH in the airplane and uh, this is, you know, once again, kind of, I think kind of like a gee whiz thing because, you know, from a practical standpoint, if you're actually troubleshooting a problem on the airplane with one of these systems here, um, I, I don't know you're going to go right to this book, you know, at any course of the troubleshooting of, you know, if you had a failure of one of these flight control computers, but um, it is there and it is just something to point out and talk to you. And you, once again, you can pause the presentation, you kind of mold this over a little bit uh, more uh, at your leisure there. Uh, but anyways, it, it's just kind of this business that, that shows us that um, furthermore built into the system is that each one of these computers kind of backs up, you know, another one of the computers in the system. So that if you did have a failure in one of them, um, you're still going to have plenty of means of controlling the airplane, doing everything you need to do with it. And that's just kind of what this, this QRH procedure here on the Flight Controls Architecture page is talking about. And just an example, um, what we're doing is looking, you know, for all the, um, the acronyms that we'd, we'd mentioned before. And uh, these little arrows here just kind of tell you that, um, you know, which system backs up which system. You know, so for example, um, ELAC 1 is backed up by ELAC number 2. And SEC 1 is uh, backed up by SEC number 2. And you can see there's these little diagonals that kind of cross, you know, link the, um, you know, different systems to, you know, get to accomplish different things in the airplane that it might need to happen if, if there was a failure. But... Um, once again, it's really kind of gee whiz stuff, and, and any kind of failure that um, you're needing to troubleshoot one of these things is going to be, you know, it's going to be directed by the ECAM essentially. So, um, it's just interesting. Uh, one page there to, to mention to you um, in uh, the QRH there, like we said. So, um, talking also about uh, what lights might come on. So these. These switches themselves, they're nothing more than toggle switches, so ons and offs for the system. So just wanted to show you on the lights test here what you would actually potentially see here. 99% um, of the time or, you know, or more, um, everything is just dark up there because they're never really up there you know, manipulating these switches normally. So everything is out, but uh, if you did you know, reach up and you know, push one of the buttons, turn it off, you'd have the off light come on for, for each one, <clears throat> excuse me, respectively. Or you might see a fault light come on, and that just very simply tells you that you know, one of the computers is faulted. And once again, there's going to be some sort of uh, indication on the eCam to, to tell you, you know, what exactly is going on. But uh, just to reiterate also, you know, how do we interact with these switches every day uh, in our normal routine flight operations? And that is, uh, quite simply, we don't. Uh, unless there's something wrong, um, we're never up there touching these and manipulating these normally. So they just always stay in the, the on and pushed in position. So um, that kind of wraps up everything I had in mind to talk with you uh, today about the flight control computers on board the airplane. Um, I didn't really get any other comments uh, since I made the last video uh, as far as questions were concerned. But once again, if you do, get, do have questions and there's some, some specific things that I can answer for you guys, I'm, I'm trying to do that uh, in each segment at the end uh, as things come up. So feel free to just leave a comment or uh, shoot me a private message and I'd be happy to uh, do my best to answer your questions. So. Uh, once again, I really appreciate you guys joining me. Thanks for your time, and we'll talk to you on the next segment. Okay, have a great day.